Thank you. It's so great to be here uh, on this important panel. We see the energy transition, and we've heard many times, is, is catalyzing this push, the demand growth exponential. We've heard some of the numbers earlier today. Um, but it's also expanding the, what are the minerals that are being, that are needed for the energy transition, and opening up new frontiers for exploration, uh, and where are we going to go uh, get them, and how are we going to build this, this supply chain. And of course, the southern hemisphere, Africa and Latin America in particular, uh, are, have the greatest geologic endowment on the planet for many of these critical minerals. And so, uh, it is my absolute delight to have representatives from both government as well as the private sector, because it takes two, the, with governments establishing the enabling environments and, and, and working with companies to actually produce these minerals that we're talking about. So I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to, to, to moderate this panel today. I'd like to open up in turn with, to, to Her Excellency the Ambassador as, as a representative from Tanzania and, 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 and could speak about uh, how she sees the energy transition and how does this partnership with government as well as companies, uh, how does he see this evolving today and what should we be looking for next? Thank you, Frank. It's a pleasure to, to be here um, and particularly because uh, and here I thank the SAFE team, in particular Robbie and, and Abigail, um, to be able to have a voice from the southern Africa uh, region that has a high concentration of critical minerals and strategic minerals. Um, it's estimated to be about 30% of uh, the world's sort of reserves. And uh, in a, my previous capacity as head of Africa, the World Economic Forum, uh, was very much um, aware of the ecosystem conversations taking place, uh, mainly driven by cobalt at that time and then expanding. So it's great to see the excitement about um, how we manage the supply chains for these minerals, uh, not just from the uh, production end, but also from the sourcing end. And the key concern from then and uh, um, subsequently after moving to DC was to increase the participation of the governments, the sourcing countries. Um, a lot of the conversations hitherto have been, and even here in DC, been dominated by other players other than our countries. And uh, this is uh, a concern uh, for my colleagues and I, and uh, very active in outreach to say, please don't have these conversations without us, mm -hmm. because ultimately um, we will become a hindrance, because we are also having conversations about where we want to see the mining sector go. We're mineral-rich countries, uh, particularly in the Southern Africa development uh, region, the stable, then uh, Western Africa, and we have a long history of, of mining and the challenges of natural resource management from governance um, to envir meeting environmental standards um, to labor standards as well. And so our concern has been less, uh, less focused on the critical and strategic minerals, but more on how to improve the mining uh, industry. So that's been a major driver. And so there's been this disconnect with the world moving forward with the EVs and battery um, and not fully connecting with conversations we're having about how can we do a better job in general. And then or now there's renewed pressure, uh, but underlying that is just a need um, and a critical one. And I'll, I'll stop with this, which is the emphasis on value addition. So a key concern uh, with states, including my own, is that we fail to see the trickle down effect of the mining sector. A mining sector competes with tourism as the largest source of foreign exchange, um, is on track to contribute 10% of our GDP, so hugely important uh, for our country and aspiration to become a, a middle income country uh, in the near term. With that history of not seeing that trickle down effect, mm -hmm. um, there's heavy emphasis on some value addition and a big pressure is coming from our local communities, so civil society, it's about 
proper governance and uh, ensuring that everyone benefits. And so that's also another reason for us to sit together in, in partnership and talk about how we move forward with this renewed pressure, which is also being driven more by external considerations rather than industry-based considerations. That's fantastic. The, this tension between local uh, participation and allowing uh, the, the communities, the state, the country to, to, to benefit directly. Um, I think there's a tension here. And, um, and I'm going to turn to, to Brian uh, because I'm, I'm, you know, you see an increasing trend of countries requiring or banning the export of the commodity and requiring processing in, in, their, in their jurisdiction some degree of beneficiation. Um, and it's spreading. Multiple countries are adopting this in Africa, but elsewhere as well. And there's a, and I guess as, a, as an investor, as someone who's developing minds, Brian, I guess what I'd be curious to understand is how you see, see this beneficiation value addition in country. Um, where does that, is, is there a tipping point where it, the investment the investability of that is, is, is reduced? or how do you have, Because there's a balance that has to be struck by on behalf of the country, but also as, as an investor to get that, to realize that return. How do you, how do you is this a consideration you've weighed? It is, and it's a very, very important objective to encourage value addition in countries that are rich in primary resource of critical minerals. And it's something that we as mining investors have to um, do everything we can to encourage, to support, to invest in, and to make happen. However, as you say, it can be detrimental to the investability in the primary resource, and we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that a lot of the value addition, a lot of the employment generation, and a lot of the economic spin-off from critical minerals come from primary resource extraction. Processing is really important, and it's very, very important for countries like Tanzania to encourage as much um, domestic value addition and industry as possible for all the obvious reasons. But it's also very important to do that in a way that does not reduce the attractiveness and hence the scale of investment in the development of those resources. So there's the, that, and I think Tanzania is a very good and relatively rare example of a country doing it right and incentivizing, enabling, and creating the right environment to encourage investment, because without the investment in resources, in projects that are profitable and viable and competitive, none of it works. And there's a, a tendency across not only Africa and not only the developing world, but all of the resource-rich world, to pander to electoral, populist, um, resource nationalist imperatives and try and eat the goose before it lays the golden egg and force processing onto primary resource projects as an additional tax on those projects rather than encourage it with additional incentives in order to increase the scale of investment and the relevance that countries like Tanzania will have in this massive critical minerals supply demand dislocation over the next five and 10 and 15 and 20 years, where countries like Tanzania can and will, we hope, play a very, very important role, not only in terms of scaling demand, uh, supply, in terms of high standards, but in terms of independence on the ge global geopolitical stage from the present incumbent, namely China, who controls most of these global critical mineral supply chains. Yeah, no, that is, that's a great lead-in, because uh, I like to turn to Helena Matza uh, with respect to China. We're, we're sitting here struggling and wrestling with these major questions about how to include local communities, how do we create a constantly strive to have higher standards. Um, is this conversation happening in Beijing? How do they see this, uh, in this investment climate, and how can the U.S. position itself where we're seeking to constantly push for higher standards, things that uh, are appropriate and they're correct and the right thing to do, but they do have a cost. And if the drive is affordability, how do we strike that tension when we're competing against a country 
which is not really a competition because that would suggest we're all playing in the same game. But how, do, how, how, do, how, do, how does the U.S. government currently think about this conversation? Uh, and how do we expand this values-driven kind of uh, responsible sourcing idea uh, when the dominant player certainly hasn't shown an interest in these, in these virtues? Yeah, it's a great question. And as we're thinking through kind of the geopolitics of the whole energy transition and what we want to see as more diversified supply chains and investment all across the way, we know that that diversity is really what's going to create resiliency in a supply chain or a series of supply chains that are not really operating as, as a market. And Brian and others probably could attest to that from their own experiences participating directly um, as a private sector representative. And so as we have been responding to this posture of being in, in real economic competition with China um, and also having a desire, not just as the United States, but I would say a shared desire among many of our like-minded partners to ensure that these supply chains are healthy, right? Because if we're not investing in critical minerals or strategic minerals and thinking about the processing, thinking about the end-use markets, we're absolutely going to fall short on this amazing climate ambition, not only that we're seeing in the United States, but really shared among so many countries um, around the world as we're all increasing those commitments to decarbonize our economies. Um, so one of the ways that we really think about tackling this is one, we, we're trying to and have started to understand the challenge better. And it's not consistent material to material. You can definitely make an argument that some of these commodities are, are certainly more constrained, not necessarily only on the production side, but really, really acutely on the processing side. And so when we see materials like graphite, like rare earths that are you know, hitting 80 to 90% processing in one country, and then we're seeing export controls being announced that could be lever leveraged at any time, there's no question that we have to take some action. And we know also competing dollar by dollar is not the approach that has worked before. So in addition to this front-end enabling environment work, where we're working with our partners in the global south and beyond to improve transparency in the regulatory frameworks as they're thinking and revising their mining codes, we're responding to requests, which is, I think, you know, that's nice, thank you, but we also want to see investment come alongside at the same time. And we're working with the G7 and some additional partners as well to figure out how we can do that, how we can use our tools to de-risk that investment, to be able to crowd in more private capital, not just around mining projects by themselves, although they're very important, but around the ecosystem that supports the mining industry. And so by thinking through what is real value addition, Yes, it's great to go further downstream, and there's a wonderful processing project that we're helping support in Tanzania that we're very excited to see get up and running. But value addition is ensuring that you are designing a project and you have the right public and private tools around it that are ensuring that people from that community are being hired, that you're investing in critical nodes or backbone infrastructure that allows those materials to move in the region and to the global markets in a way that invites the development of additional sectors. And so as we've been really reframing our approach to global infrastructure, we're taking an and, and, and view, not just because we think it's a good idea, but it's uh, really answering the, 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 the question that we've been asked by our partners, especially in emerging economies, to approach them where they are and try to bring investors alongside this additional work. And it's, it's slow moving, it takes time. It is not a even playing field. But as we continue to demonstrate success, as companies that are really participating in that race to top are demonstrating that their investments are benefiting the people of these communities more and happening at a clip that's fast enough that can serve the political needs of the countries where these resources are, we're slowly proving the case that it can be done like this and that additional competition is really good for everybody. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's, uh, the challenge is we're slowly doing it, but we have ambitions that aren't terribly slow. And how do we right-size that? And Rafe, you, you have a company, a technology company, uh, and you're seeking to unlock 
some of these minerals in new kinds of ways, lithium in particular. Yeah, you also have an exploration component to your company. And I was, what, what is, how do you see your ability to explore and deploy your technology in the Southern Hemisphere? And how do you see this race for capital, your ability to extract capital and deploy capital, most importantly, in these countries? How, how do you see that uh, evolving? How have you been recently? And how do you see the trend line advancing in the near term? Yeah, th thanks for the, the question. Um, Lilac, we have uh, projects within Chile, Argentina for lithium. You know, if you just step back and you look at the, the demand for lithium over the next decade, it's huge. We've gone from 300,000 tonnes of production globally five years ago to about a million now. It's going to go to three million by the end of the decade and five or six the decade after. Um, there's really no way you supply or you close that supply gap without developing lithium operations in the lithium triangle down there in Latin America. And I'm concerned that, uh, you know, the, the IRA is great. I think it could be transformational. But I'm concerned that there are aspects of it that um, need to be changed a little bit to help some of these countries out. So, uh, you know, Argentina is not part of the free trade agreement. And yet I think it's a really critical part uh, to close the supply gap over the next decade. Um, you know, and if we, if we can't attract um, Western investors into Argentina, then I, I know who will be there. Mm -hmm. And that means that uh, we are losing ground. And so I'm concerned about that. And I think you can look back at history and you can look at what happened with rare earths, and where over time 90% of processing of rare earths ended up in one place. And uh, I, I think that's something we need to try and avoid with these other critical minerals, whether we're talking about lithium or cobalt or nickel. And so, you know, maybe we can get to a point where, you know, um, um, help uh, from projects like the IRA are focused more around the actual project rather than the country the project is in. Is the project doing the right thing by the community it's in? Is it funded um, by, you know, people we feel is friendly? Um, is the product going to bolster the supply chains that we want and, and help domestic uh, production? I think those are the questions that would be great to base uh, assistance on. Yeah, I think it's a well point. I, I think that having, looking at the FTA designation of determining who's in, who's out is a terribly crude approach. I think we have to have a far more nuanced approach, which should be project specific because not uh, rather than relying on a historic or a relationship. Um, Ambassador, the IRA gets a lot of airtime, and appropriately so. Um, but the IRA doesn't really touch your country. Uh, how, how do you see the U.S. government uh, investment, and in, in not just the U.S. government, because the U.S. government is important, but it's really the, the private capital that the U.S. can, uh, U.S. industry can can deploy. How do you see that evolving in, in, your, in, in your country and other countries? Um, whereas the IRA, it's, it's really what we're really talking about oftentimes are the tax credit and harvesting tax benefits that someone gets, um, but it, it's kind of remote in terms of your, it touching your country and, and other similarly situated countries. How, how do you see this evolving um, and capital flowing into your country or not for you trying to do things the right way and we have clear alignment. How do you see that evolving? So I see it evolving um, in three ways. I'll just focus on three areas. One is um, just in general in terms of financial flows. Um, what the IRA has done is to redirect FDI to the US. Mm. So there's, uh, and it makes a lot of sense. I mean, apart from being incentivized, it's a known market, and um, Africa as a whole is fairly unknown, and therefore it's considered riskier. And so uh, the IRA, in a way, sort of re-entrenched that uh, redirection of, of capital, um, and or you know, the increased premiums if uh, you were to get US investment uh, into the continent. Um, so that's created demand of, uh, of another kind with respect to what kind of support the U.S. government can provide to incentivize that capital to still flow uh, to 
uh, sourcing countries like uh, Tanzania. Um, and one key concern, and I'd love to hear uh, what the, my fellow panelists have to say, is that what we hear from the few American investors that are investing uh, in critical, critical minerals in Tanzania, so graphite, nickel in particular, uh, is that it's so difficult to get funding from the US uh, DFC, Development Finance Corporation. It's highly bureaucratic, um, doesn't operate as a DFI, which means they, they are similar in terms of the minimal risk appetite mm. as private capital, and yet under these difficult, more complex circumstances, you would expect um, that uh, they would provide that flexibility and therefore be able to attract and, and attract more American investment. Um, and this is a general concern that they express because of the environment that they're in. Um, again, as a mineral resource country, uh, most of our, traditionally, our main um, mining um, investment countries have been uh, companies from Canada and Australia. Mm -hmm. So they've been very dominant in our mining industry, and then we have South Africa, and the, the Chinese are now picking up, apart from, from others. And therefore, as they compete, they find that they are uncompetitive in terms of their ability to source financing, mm -hmm. to support, in particular, infrastructure investments that they, they need to make. Um, and the third aspect about how we're responding, uh, Tanzania is a, a, a GOA beneficiary country, and um, we're raising concerns about um, one, at least being able to uh, be considered as a critical minerals agreement country. Um, this is a particular concern because by incentivizing processing in third party countries, we're reinforcing the challenge that we have is that mm. we're not dealing direct. So our minerals will be sent to Europe or Eastern Asia, right? And then from there, we'll be sourced by the automotive industry in the US. Why can't we sell direct, right? How do we improve that relationship? Um, you mentioned the issue of consideration. We would prefer to, for it to be project-based. Mm -hmm. And those discussions are ongoing. But we'll also talk about how under AGOA, we could have a reframing because the only FTA currently in Africa is Morocco. So that puts everyone at a disadvantage. So how can we shift the rules of the game and the framing such that um, we don't put this um, sourcing countries and therefore this, this supply chain in particular at risk? Um, and how can we get more creative by using instruments that are in place? Thank you for that. I, yeah, your, your points about the DFC, uh, I, I think, are well, are well taken. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the administration talks about the tools in the toolbox. Unfortunately, they don't take that tool out very often. Uh, and uh, they, they ought to take it out a lot more. Uh, there, there's only been one company that I'm aware of that, uh, which their DFC is making an equity level investment. Um, uh, you, you raised, uh, you know, maybe I'd like to turn it over to Helena uh, as the U.S. official here uh, to be able to speak about Africa and, and the U.S. Because the U.S., uh, I have to say, is showing up in Africa, um, is in attending events and, 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 and is going many, you know, many trips uh, there. Um, and so there are efforts underway. But maybe, Helena, could you speak to uh, the work that, I know you've been involved in leading many times, but also this issue with how to mobilize U.S. DFC financing since, I mean, Exim Bank and the chair is an amazing ambassador to, to, to finance, but that, that's a different product. Um, could you speak to this, uh, where we are and where, where we should be? Yeah, there's so many threads to pick up on, and I think that the points that the ambassador raised are, are certainly issues that we grapple with and sit on and are digesting how we can evolve our approach to um, really address our partners, but also the investment that we need and know that has to go into to this supply chain as a whole and, and into the, the economies that we're talking about. Um, a couple pieces. One, I just want to go back to, to the IRA and the bipartisan infrastructure law. These are incredibly transformative pieces of legislation, and I think everyone in this room would agree, um, have done amazing things, not just to boost the clean energy sector in our own economy, but to push the conversation on EV deployment globally. After us, the Europeans, the Canadians, the Australians, we all came out with those commitments to ensure that we are working to push a market in a direction 
that is aligned not just with climate ambition, but is giving a clear signal that all of these materials and all of the countries that are part of this journey are going to be an important piece of that, of that calculus. And it creates an opportunity for so many of our countries in the global south to find a way to monetize resources in a way that maybe they haven't in the past, especially those who were able to participate um, in the first wave of, of energy commodities. So I just want to put that out there. Um, but there's no, there's no question. We talk about this race to the top. So we want to have the best investors. We want the best companies out there. We want to have the countries that have these resources demand that type of investment, yet it will continue to cost slightly more. So how do we bridge that gap? At the same time as we're thinking through how we use US tools, how we use European financing tools, they hold those same requirements, right, that our companies do that are working through their due diligence process to ensure that they're really investing in that community in the right way. So there's no question. We want those values, but we all want to move faster. And so part of the work that we've been doing on, on the continent in particular, as yes, we've had a lot of cabinet officials come in and out um, of, of many African countries, we also have deployed over $1.5 billion in 12 months in the Libido Corridor. We have helped finance with DFC a rail refurbishment project that connects the Angola port directly, the port of Libido, to the copper cobalt belt, to, to Kowesi. We're investing in the first in a generation greenfield rail project that the US and with our anchor partners um, in the EU and the AFDB are helping design. These are all supporting the ecosystem of investment. We're beginning conversations with, with your government as well to think through how do we potentially ultimately connect to Chisara? How do we support those processing hubs? And so, yes, there's a lot of ambition. You're hearing a lot of enthusiasm. But we know that enthusiasm is only as good as the dollars we can deploy. And that's why we're, we, we want to be everywhere. But we're starting in focused approaches where we can help support this and other sectors at the same time. And by the way, that rail line that we helped refurbish already had its first test shipments. And in addition to the copper that will move on that rail, we're already seeing commitments from Angola ag producers to utilize that rail going in the other direction. And so this is not the fastest journey. We would love for it to be faster. The last thing I'll say on this point is in addition to trying to deploy our own tools as quickly as we can. And I will say in the Libido project, that includes DFC, XM, we have USAID and TDA, all financing different aspects of the rail, clean energy deployment, agro-business, and some telecom expansions as well. And we love the idea of continuing that work into Tanzania. We're also working more closely with the private financial institutions. And we do see the same problem that was raised today. A lot of capital on the sidelines, a lot of it moving back into the OECD, which is good, and we're glad that we're creating a market for investment in the US. But we need to get some of that back into the global market. And one of the biggest pieces of, or the biggest requests we get back is, tell us where you're going to be focused. Tell us where the US and your partners are going to provide the de-risking tools we need, whether that's political risk insurance, whether that's um, actual loan assistance, where can you be with us so we can start testing, moving back into, into these markets in a meaningful way? Um, that's not all going to happen at once, but it's a huge piece. And any project that we're working on right now includes a private partner on the front end, meaning, yes, we have some concessional dollars, Yes, we're working with the MDBs, but we must have a private anchor that has those values that are willing to do the work to demonstrate that we can rinse and repeat this model more. So while it's more slow moving than we would prefer, we definitely want to demonstrate we can do this, and then we want to keep expanding this approach. Yeah, very good. Um, Brian, how do you see this ability you know, exploration budgets are not increasing. Uh, we see, we're here, we're talking about exponential growth in mineral demands. Exploration budgets in the West are not anywhere where they should be. Um, and they, have, uh, they haven't grown much at all. And it's not a COVID issue, it's something else. Um, 
you know, I, I, I probably think it's because China's ability to manipulate supply and pricing is undermining a lot of the investment thesis uh, that a lot of entrepreneurial companies, private equity, whomever, they're, they're reluctant to deploy that capital. In, 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 first, I'm curious to see if you would agree with that, with, with that hypothesis. And secondly, to what extent would, uh, regardless of the quantum, but some bit of American money in a project, to what extent would that, could that change that, that, that case to make those projects more attractive, to attract that mm. kind of that halo effect of, of broader investment? Mm. Firstly, you're totally right. That's part of the inadequacy of exploration expenditure on the part of Western companies is a product of particularly what's happening in the market now is a very good illustration of why people aren't investing to the extent they need to to fill this supply gap three, four, five, and ten years out, which is becoming increasingly unavoidable and inevitable, and in fact, increasing every day. At the moment, we've got very low metal prices. We've got a very depressed listed equity uh, market environment, um, and therefore, a lot of good projects that need to be built to fill the supply gap are being delayed or scrapped, and the supply gap is growing, and China's overwhelmingly dominant control over these global critical mineral supply chains is likewise growing every day because they're not slowing down their investment programs because they can afford to take a medium-term view, whereas a lot of investors in the West, in alignment with US interests, cannot afford to take a medium-term view. And, and a lot of that is encouraged by Chinese engagement in the market, not only in terms of investment and oversupply in the short term, but in terms of overhyping the scale of their investment and future supply prospects, particularly with reference to um, Indonesian nickel production, which is artificially depressing an already depressed market and killing a lot of competition so that their overwhelmingly dominant medium-term position is increased. Um, so what, from a US government seed investing point of view, I mean, we as TechMed have been the fortunate recipient of direct equity investment from the DFC um, initially in 2020 and then again in 22 and 23. And for us, as an example, it's been completely transformative, um, not only in terms of the DFC being a very supportive and engaging um, shareholder and partner, but in terms of the perception of credentializing and de-risking that US government funding agency investment comes with, and hence the extent to which it's catalyzed and allowed us to accelerate the securing of other sources of investment and the acceleration of the program of development across our 10 operating assets in North America, South America, Europe and As Africa. And I hope that what DFC has done for TechMet will be replicated many times over. And I do understand the frustration of a lot of other players who have found engaging, tedious and slow and bureaucratic. Um, but I think the will is there and the intention is there and there'll be a lot more done, hopefully with us, through us, but with others in parallel with us. Um, to make that particular government agency much more relevant at moving the dial in this, in this space. And likewise, XM, likewise, DOE, likewise, DOD, all of whom have a lot higher level of prioritization, prioritization and intent to engage in the space more effectively and more proactively than they have up till now. So it is, you know, government is never an easy business and it's bureaucratic and political and by its nature, um, can be slow, but at least the understanding and analysis and intent is now there, which wasn't necessarily the case three, four, five years ago or seven years ago when we started um, TechMet. Yeah, thanks. And I, I, uh, I think it's important that the U.S. government be slow and methodical and disciplined because it's our money. Uh, and, and so it needs to be invested wisely, but it just needs to be invested. Rafe, how, how do you see um, this, this, some of this competition and you know, you're trying to do new things in, in you mentioned Argentina and Chile, um, the increasing level of state take is, 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 is moving forward, uh, particularly in Chile. You see between those two countries, pretty wide political swings. Um, and we're almost out of time here, but I was just curious to get your sense of, of that uh, because I think it's also a lesson on how to, how to manage a business 
through through those the, the, sort of the political uh, noise. Well, in a few years, come and ask me and see if I've been successful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to go back to the previous point. I, I do think there's an opportunity if you look at funding that we have available versus other countries. I think there are other countries getting involved earlier. Mm. And I think that seed funding, Brian's point, is really, really important um, to be able to try and sort out uh, to help. Um, just the general theme is let's lean into making as many countries out there as friendly as possible and broaden the net that the IRA and others apply to. I mean, if we can do that, I think we've got a good chance of this heading in the right direction. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, panel. We need both governments and industry uh, to work together. I think this is a... This is, this is a good foundation for more discussions later. <laughs> thank you. Please. Thank you.